welcome, dear viewers, to Couch Warrior TV on YouTube. I'm the Couch Warrior, and you are watching an Aranus Arcana update. Uh, this is just a little video. Uh, I've been doing a lot of playtesting lately. You may have seen a playtesting video that came out over the weekend. A lot of stuff going on here, and I thought it was time for an update to kind of let you know what was going on, and also to answer some questions that are coming in. I'm getting questions about the series on Discord and on YouTube. I thought it might be a good opportunity to answer some of those questions because, uh, frankly, they're good ones. Um, they're, they're questions that uh, I certainly need to answer myself and I think would uh, be interesting for you to know as well. I think it's important to understand some of the things that are going on with the story and some of the things that are going to affect production, some of the challenges uh, that I am contending with here that are going to have an impact, like it or not on the story. So, uh, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for your support on this whole thing. Uh, it's been really, really amazing. And uh, the footage that we're looking at right now is footage of, <clears throat> is this, this is solo footage of Fleet Arcane Archer Assassin going through a Foral Host uh, Barrow down by Riften. And I thought this would be interesting because, for those of you who are familiar uh, with my Ashes series, more specifically Shadeling, you know that I actually spent a very long time kind of playtesting that character, trying to understand how to play Shadeling. And there's a lot more to it than you might think. Um, when I create characters, I like to create combat styles. Part of the fun for me is creating a combat style. And I think we saw this on display for the first time with Fleet. More specifically with, with Fleet's kind of sword fighting style, right? Dual wielder. Uh, I did a series uh, as part of Death Mentor on how to kind of create your own fighting style. And I used Fleet as an example of that. Well, uh, things have changed, right? I mean, uh, in the old series, obviously, we were using uh, primarily vanilla perks. We had some mods in place, but not perk overhauls. So we were using vanilla perks. Uh, Fleet has been completely respect for the new series using Ordinator and uh, a couple other mods that kind of go along with Ordinator uh, that were created by Anai Scion. Or if they weren't accredited by a nice ion, they have Ordinator patches. Um, I'm a big fan of Ordinator perk overhaul. So Fleet has been respect to use that. And uh, the, the outcome really has been that it has made, I think, Fleet a much more interesting character from a combat perspective than he was before. He's still going to have the same focus as before. He's basically an arcane archer assassin is what we're calling him. But he's also he also is is very competent with swords as well. So a lot of bow work we're going to see a mixture of spell work, uh, primarily focused on kind of stealth related spells or spells that I transform into stealth related spells, and uh, sword work. So just so everybody knows what's going on, um, I know that a lot of you out there saw my announcement and immediately started watching the old series. I think that's great. Um, I think you should do that. And uh, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, I am doing that myself as well. In fact, I've made it so far up to episode 21. And I've got a little notebook here where I'm taking down notes of the things that I need to remember. Whether they pertain to quests completed, um, perks selected, spells used or very sort of character and role play focused things like Fleet's attitude about certain things. This is all kind of a refresher for me too to kind of remind myself of who Fleet is or was as a character so that we can kind of pick up where we left off, okay? So uh, when we left off, now I went back and I watched the videos. I, I had a feeling that when we left off, Fleet was somewhere around level 45. Now I went and confirmed this and we, we don't actually get to see Fleet's perks toward the end of the series. 
Uh, I think we see his perks probably four or five episodes from the end. That's the last time that we see him. And at that time, he was at level 43. So I am playing this out as, as though that were the case. So when the series starts, we're going to see Fleet playing at, at higher level. Uh, he is going to be, you know, over level 40. Um, now I say over because I can't really put my finger on exactly what level he's going to be when we get started. There are a certain number of things that I need to complete in order to be able to start the story. So one of the questions that I had, and I think this is really important one, it was a great question and, and something that uh, I need to explain so that everybody kind of understands what we're dealing with here. Um, I am not resuming Fleet's story from the old save. That would be impossible for me to do. Uh, Im impossible for a number of different reasons. Well, the main reason that it's impossible is because I was playing that, of course, on Legacy Skyrim. Now I'm playing on Skyrim SE. So we're basically, we're porting Fleet over to Skyrim Special Edition. As a result, there are numerous mods that I was using in Legacy that I simply can't use in Special Edition. And all of that stuff is embedded in those saved games. So because of that, if I tried to load, an, even if there was a, a good way to convert a game from Legacy to SE, if I tried to load that game missing all those mods, uh, it would never work, not in a million years. So what that means is that I really have to start s Fleet from scratch. So what I have done is used kind of some, you know, face gen data to just make sure that I had his facial features down like they needed to be. Um, and then after that, I advanced him to level 30 using console commands. And then I started playing through the quests that he had completed uh, during the first series. So, and when I say played them through, I'm playing them through very quickly. I'm using fast travel. I'm not, you know, I'm not hiking it all the way. So I'm literally using fast travel to just blast through these quests and make sure that I'm getting them complete. Uh, now it is possible to use console commands to advance quests also, but that is extremely risky and, and can cause a lot of problems with the game. So I'm not doing that. Um, so I have to kind of play them through just to preserve the integrity of the game itself, of the save. So th that's fairly important. So a lot of the stuff that's going on right now is me kind of playing through this, but I'm also taking the opportunity to work on this conversion from vanilla perks to ordinator perks and work out some of this combat style stuff. And some of that we're seeing on display here. There's some interesting things going on here um, as, as, as I'm really digging into areas of the Ordinator perk trees that I haven't explored before. Uh, one of those is a high level perk called Lion's Arrow that is part of the archery perk tree. Basically what it allows me to do is uh, assign a spell effect to my bow using a power. So I can assign one effect. And I, I played around with this quite a bit. Um, I thought, well, you know, the obvious thing to do is I could use something like lightning, right? And what this basically means is that when you release an arrow from the bow, it's going to just dis it's going to discharge whatever that spell effect is. Fleet is not what I would call a destruction type magic user. Uh, he was always illusion and conjuration, and then we used some alteration for utility. Stuff like that, right? So I really tried to focus on what was the bread and butter uh, for this character. And what I really discovered was that w we have an interesting opportunity here to get back to our roots as far as this, this concept of the arcane archer. Uh, the Ordinator perks really make it possible to do some really wild stuff. So what you're seeing here is I've used the Lion's Arrow perk, which is at the top of the, the archery perk tree, and I have assigned the Illusion spell Shadow Bond to the bow. And if you're familiar with Shadow, if you're not familiar with Shadow Bond, 
you've shadow bond is used pretty extensively um, by shadeling uh, although he doesn't use it at all like fleet does fleet uses it in a very different way and what it does is it is it brings a really interesting sense of of chaos um, I think to fleet's combat style which is quite interesting to watch essentially what happens is you you hit a target with the spell and then when you cast the spell a second time or the spell is broken the spell can be broken by a shout it can be broken by going into your inventory or drawing a weapon or opening a door when that is discharged basically you and the target switch places that's what it does it basically allows you to switch places with your target now imagine you you put that on a bow so basically what's happening is I'm I'm shooting enemies and then I'm shadow bonding with them and then when the spell is broken we switch places now it, it has some really interesting effects on combat as you can imagine and it really discharges in unexpected ways so if what I've discovered is that if I hit an enemy with it if I'm bonded to an enemy and uh, that shadow bond is broken when the enemy shouts at me for example which these draugr do a lot that will break the bond and, and cause us to swap so it adds a real element of of randomness and serendipity to combat that sometimes is is frustrating and sometimes is so brilliant uh, it, it's it's amazing so I've really uh, been having a lot of fun with that so I've been using that in conjunction with um, Ghost Walk, which was also a favorite of Fleet from the first series. So Ghost Walk is coming back. That was one that he used to do quite a few assassinations and pull off some cool stuff. So we're definitely bringing that back. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to kind of see the Shadow Bond working here in action right now, as a matter of fact. So I'm, I'm going to use the shout here, throw voice, and I'm going to draw the skeevers down. Now I'm going to shoot at those skeevers. I'm going to shadow bond with them. And then with a second arrow, I'll be switching places. You can see I've shadow bonded. Now I've switched. Now I'm behind them. They don't know where I am, and I'm firing at them from the other end of the room. Um, it's brilliant when it works. And when it doesn't work like you expect, it causes all kinds of chaos. But the one thing that is absolutely true in either case is that the Arcane Archer Assassin is is bringing a lot of, I think, sort of stylish spell use to combat. Now, it, it may be it may be chaotic and crazy, but I think that's part of what I feel Fleet has sort of a history of doing. We've talked a lot with this character about chaos, embracing the chaos, right? And that's what he brings to the battlefield, and that's how he keeps his opponents off balance. And so this seemed like a really cool thing to work on. So I was kind of practicing here. Um, originally, when I found that perk, when I started reading up on the Lion's Arrow perk, I was thinking about, you know, what, what kind of spell can I put on this? I, I tried some different things. Um, I, I tried playing around with, you know, some more offensive style spells and stuff like that. And it just really wasn't, it wasn't popping for me. It just, you know, if, if I want a bow that, you know, shoots lightning or something like that, I'll get something that's enchanted that way. What, what this does is this perk allows the archer assassin, the arcane archer assassin fleet to have a ton of utility. So anytime I'm out of combat, I can change which spell I'm binding to my bow. So it allows me to put different spells in place for different combat situations. And uh, it, it creates an incentive, I think, for Fleet to prepare ahead, but to also explore spell options more than he used to. Uh, it used to be that, you know, Fleet kind of had a handful of go-to spells that, that he would that he would go to all the time. But now we've got, you know, kind of a reason to try some other stuff. You can see here in the perk tree, I'm going into archery here. 
way up at the top of the tree here. We, we can't see it yet. Uh, maybe we can at the top. Yeah, it's that, that top perk. I took Hailstorm here because uh, what I discovered is I needed to up my fire rate. So one of the challenges that I've discovered through playtesting with, with fleet like this is that playing exclusively with a bound bow at legendary difficulty is quite tough. <laughs> it's really it's really hard because um, the bound bow doesn't do a ton of damage, right? I mean, yes, it does a ton of damage if you're playing at low level, but if you're playing, you know, up over level 40 or 50 at legendary difficulty, um, you're going to get much better damage out of a bow that you craft yourself and can smith up the damage on it, right? Now... What that does, obviously, is it creates a very deadly bow where you're one-shotting everything, but then it also causes your combat to be a little bit one-dimensional. In other words, you're you're always playing the same way. You're sneaking up, you're hit, you know, you're hitting them from range, and nothing interesting ever happens. Well, having a bow that is slightly less powerful, but is willing to or able to accept any spell that I care to put on it creates a completely different scenario. It means that I'm preparing for battle ahead of time, I'm thinking about the kinds of spells I could use in certain situations, and I may, may even, you know, take an opportunity to take a break in the middle of a dungeon or something like that and change out the spell that's bound to my bow for the particular situation I'm in. It really spices up the combat and makes things extremely interesting. So. Uh, very, very uh, excited about it. I think that is going to add a lot. I think what we're going to see in this series is a real, a real amping up of this idea of the arcane archer and what the possibilities are. Um, I feel like in the first series, arcane archer was more or less just a label, but for all practical purposes, he was really just kind of a good multi-purpose warrior, right? I think this, we're, we're going to see something very different. We're going to see we're going to see uh, Fleet having a much deeper selection of spells and options now than we had before, which I think is going to cause our protagonist to go down some unexpected routes when it comes to combat or completion of some of these missions. I think it'll really add some interesting variety to the combat. So that is pretty damn exciting, in my opinion. Uh, so what do we know so far? Well... What we know is that when when the series starts, when the when the Black Epic begins, Fleet is going to be somewhere between, I would say, level 40 and level 50. In my playtesting right now, he is already, I think, at level 43. So my guess is that by the time I get through the basic content that I need to get through, we'll probably be looking at level 45, which is just about exactly where we left off. Now the perk selection will be very different, of course, because we're not doing vanilla, but the level will be, the level will be right. Uh, as far as difficulty goes, um, I've been doing my play testing at both Master and Legendary. Uh, I'm going to be playing at a minimum on Master difficulty. I may try to play on Legendary if I can. It just depends on how my playtesting goes. If I feel like I'm getting the combat down, if I'm, if I'm getting the hang of everything that I need to use, and I'm figuring out fleet style, then we, we can always amp up the difficulty a little bit. But we'll be starting out at Master and just kind of seeing how it goes, unless by some miracle I get through this playtesting and feel really comfortable with Legendary. But the goal is going to be playing fleet at Legendary difficulty um, in the long haul, in the long run, right? We may not start there right away, but we'll get there. Um, so which quests have I played through? So basically what I've done to this point is I have advanced Fleet through the Thieves' Guild quest line as far as he was when our story left off. Uh, I have very nearly advanced him through the Alduin quest line. I've advanced him to the point in the Alduin quest line just before he does his infiltration of the embassy. Now, that leaves Dark Brotherhood. I mean, these these were really the three major quest lines that Fleet touched. Now, you may be saying, well, you have to do the Dark Brotherhood 
You have to do the Dark Brotherhood, right? Uh, actually, I'm not going to do the Dark Brotherhood. What we're going to do is we're going to pick the story up where it left off and say that the events of the end of Aranus Arcana Act 3 have taken place. So for all practical purposes, Astrid is dead. Okay, it's going to be as though we completed that quest line, but I'm not actually going to complete the quest line just because I don't have that kind of time. And after going through everything I could think of regarding the Dark Brotherhood quest line and trying to, you know, figure out what its, its bearing or effect would be on the overall story, I decided that there was really... I couldn't see anything there that was going to have a huge impact on our story. Like, you know, if I didn't do it, it was going to somehow uh, change the environment or not change the environment so much that the story wouldn't be viable. So uh, I have elected to not go through the Dark Brotherhood stuff. We're going to we're basically going to say that that's been completed because it has. Uh, but in my saved game, it technically won't be completed. Now, there is there's an additional strategy here about this content that, that's important to note. I'm not just leaving out the Dark Brotherhood in, in my lead-up to this um, because it's inconvenient. It's because there are some things that go on in the game, in the world, prior to your character joining the Dark Brotherhood that I want to continue to happen, that are part, I'm going to build into my story. So when the story begins, we all just need to make the assumption that Fleet has completed the Dark Brotherhood quest line. But I'm telling you this right now because there may be some anomalies. There may be some things that stick out, right? Um, you know, if, if we're trotting down the road and, and we see, you know, Cicero and his cart hanging out around by Whiterun, right? The first thing that people are going to say, well, we should be past this already. Didn't we finish this quest? Well, yes, technically we did finish that quest, but I am not finishing that quest in the lead up to this. Uh, for the story's sake, I'm going to leave that quest open because there are some things going on with it that I think are really going to benefit the story. So we're going to, we're going to suspend disbelief on that, okay? That's important. Now, that also is a good lead into some other things, right? There were all kinds of little side quests and relationships and different things in the game that Fleet touched. It would be literally impossible for me to go through and absolutely replicate all of that to make it all match up. So, we know that that's not going to happen. All right? I'm going to do my best to try to make it as consistent as I can, but understanding that I'm having to rebuild this from scratch, including completed quests, there are just going to be some instances where we will see something, right? Maybe we see a character that we thought was supposed to be dead or, you know, things like that. I am going through and writing in my notebook these items that, that are of high importance to make sure that, that the ones that are the most important are the ones that I, I make sure to get taken care of, those details, so that we have some continuity. But... I know, you know, after 114, 115 episodes, there's going to be something that I'm, that I'm going to miss. I just know it's going to happen, all right? So I'm letting you know right now that uh, that is what's going on. So there could be some anomalies. I'm hoping to avoid it, but, you know, the game being what it is, uh, I can't cover every possible detail, but I'm going to try my best. So... That is kind of how that is coming together. So it's it's uh, kind of an important distinction there because I don't I, I want to spend as little time as possible in comments debating with people about nitpicky Nat's ass type of details when what we should be talking about is the story arc. To me, that's what's important is the story, the characters, all of that stuff. Uh, nitpicky details about gameplay and stuff like that, those kinds of questions annoy me, but I know that we're, we're going to have some of those. So I'm going to do everything I can to try and address some of them here, but I'm also going to try and plug them into the FAQ. So I'm starting an FAQ on the website that'll have a whole bunch of stuff in it. So as a viewer, if uh, you see somebody asking questions that have been answered before in one of these or in the FAQ or something like that, uh, do me a favor. 
and refer them to the FAQ to get answers on that. Or if you happen to know of a a episode of one of these updates or something like that where I talked about it specifically, send them a link to that. You know, whatever you can do to help will be greatly appreciated. Uh, just because I want to make sure that I'm using my time wisely, and I think the best use of my time as the creator of this content is to answer people's questions about the story and the characters. Because that's where the real meat of it is, and that's where that's where the fun stuff is. Um, so, okay, that kind of covers some of that basic stuff. Now, let's talk a little bit about characters. If you saw the production preview, you noticed that some of our favorite characters are returning. Um, <clears throat> the, the characters that you saw in that video are not the only characters that are returning, but they were the ones that I wanted to showcase in that video. In the video, uh, obviously, we saw Nefei, we saw Miravel, and we saw Lydia. Um, I have to absolutely give props to Cal, Dirty Weasel Media. If you haven't checked out his channel, please do so. Cal has been absolutely a godsend in helping me convert mods from Legacy Skyrim into, Leg into uh, Skyrim Special Edition so that I could get some of the mods that haven't been reproduced in Special Edition in. Uh, I would not be able to actually produce this game uh, footage for the story if I didn't have some of these mods. And quite a few of them were mods that just have not been converted so cal was nice enough to do that for me he converted a whole bunch of armors he converted a whole bunch of npcs and even a location for me and he's he's been very selfless with his time and i certainly do appreciate it i am very much in his debt so uh you know if you get a chance go and check out his channel give him a thank you from me tell him i sent you because uh cal is amazing and cal is making a comeback as well he's uh, put out some new videos on his channel. He's restarted his his modding guide. Just fantastic, fantastic stuff out there. So, go and go and check that out. Cal, Cal is also going to be joining us in our panel discussion coming up here uh, in mid September. So make sure you listen into that too. He's always got lots of really uh, smart things to say about mods, the mod community in general. So good stuff. I really do appreciate that. So. We saw those three characters. Obviously, Lydia, she's going to be there. She's part of the vanilla game. But Miravel is returning. Uh, now, I'm going to say, yes, these characters are in. They made the cut. I'm not going to say how they play into the story. We'll just see how that unfolds. Um, but they're there. Now, the, the other thing that that brings to mind is that uh, there was an interesting question about whether or not Fleet was going to become a vampire. Uh, now, normally, this is the sort of question where I would just kind of shrug my shoulders and just say, hey, you'll have to wait and see, right? But this this is a great question because this is a person who is, uh, you know, really paying attention to some of the stuff that I've been doing. Uh, a while back, kind of a long while back, actually, it was before, I think it was before Special Edition, I did a live stream... Uh, it was a three-hour live stream that featured Fleet, and we were uh, just kind of, you know, kicking around. We we did the Moon Path to Elsewhere uh, quest mod, which was a lot of fun. And in that particular live stream, it was noted by many people that Fleet was in fact a vampire in that live stream. Well, I can't tell you what or is or is not going to happen in the story. But what I will tell you is that I don't consider anything in that live stream, anything that happened in that live stream to be canon as far as the story is concerned. Okay? So because he appeared as a vampire in that live stream has no bearing whatsoever on the story. So that live stream is not considered part of Fleet's story canon. Okay? And I'll just leave it at that. Um... I'm really kind of trying hard not to rope myself in. I'm, I'm really trying to just take a nice sort of pure approach to the way that I craft this story update. Um, it's really important to me that it be good. 
you know, that it be true to the character uh, and, you know, and true to the story that we were creating when we left off. And I say we, because you guys were instrumental in helping me create this story. You gave me lots of ideas. You gave me lots of um, great feedback. Um, and that has a bearing on the story. And that's what makes this kind of story so interesting and so fun and so completely unique. It's not like a movie or a book, right? Where I'm just telling you a story and you're taking it in. You guys participate in this. And that's why I always, I always refer to it as we, we're doing this, we're doing that. We did this, we did that, you know, because I really think that you guys are integral, uh, fans of, of Ernest Arcana and, and Fleet Story are integral to telling that tale. Uh, things that, that you make comments on impact the story. So that to me is a really, I think, critical distinction between what we're doing here and what might be happening if you were just, say, watching a movie or listening to an audiobook or reading a comic book or whatever. Um, I don't consider this to be a passive form of storytelling, right? Uh, you're not, you're not uh, a passive viewer. If you choose to comment, uh, your comments are noted. And there have been many occasions where, based on the comments of, of people who are fans of the story, I made changes in the way that I was doing things. Um, Story-related changes, mod-related changes, stuff like that. So, uh, so, you know, I think that's super important, and I do really appreciate all the feedback. Now, as far as feedback goes on this series, obviously, YouTube comments are amazing. We're going to continue to support YouTube content for, for sure, uh, you know, as far as comments go and stuff like that. That's always a great place. But uh, I'm hoping to create a, a fairly active community for this series on our Discord server. If you haven't checked that out, you can go to discord.charactercrusade.com. That's charactercrusade.com. Go to that URL and you can join up on our Discord server, okay? And we'll have, we've, we've already got lots of great people hanging out there doing all kinds of creative things. But we're going to create a space on there for story-related discussion. Um, and that will probably factor into some other events that are related to the story as well. So, you know, if you're interested in joining the conversation and you want to get a little bit deeper into the conversation than what uh, YouTube comments allows, go to the Discord server, sign up for that, and uh, join us there, because I think there's going to be a lot of cool stuff going on there. Now, uh, in addition to that, you can also support the story financially. If you want to do that, you are welcome to, and I certainly do appreciate it. It is not a requirement by any means. I will not be uh, holding back any story content uh, where Fleet is concerned uh, as Patreon-only stuff. So, But if you're, if you're interested in participating in that way, I really do appreciate it. And even in the last uh, week or so, there have been uh, three or four folks who have thrown in their support uh, on Patreon for the story after I made the announcement, and I really do appreciate all that support. So you can go to patreon.charactercrusade.com. That is a, a subdomain that will get you right there so you don't have to hunt around for anything. And you can contribute, you know, as little as a dollar a month if you want to. I think part of what makes Patreon so special is the fact that it's recurring. Um, the fact that you don't have to worry about it, I don't have to worry about it, and knowing that donations are recurring, it, it allows me to do some planning, some advanced planning, which is really important. And any contributions that you make uh, on Patreon will directly impact the story, whether it's from a hardware perspective, software, uh, if it's just, you know, giving me access to some resources, you know, things like that, what, whatever it is. Uh, is vitally important. So, uh, you know, I rebuilt this hardware just before uh, starting this series, starting to rebuild it. And, you know, along with that came a little bit of a hardware scare. You know, I was afraid there for, for a moment that I had lost some data and was looking at a situation where I might have to invest in another external drive in order to capture footage 
Well, luckily, I didn't have to do that at all. I was able to recover everything. It all worked out great. There was nothing wrong with my hardware at all. It was just simply a Windows update problem. So that was great. But it made me think very long and hard about um, how much I appreciate those people who support me on Patreon. Because if by chance I had needed to go out and get a replacement hard drive, I would have been able to do it. And two years ago, I would not have been able to do it. I just would have been, my, my channel would have been shut down until I had scraped together enough cash to be able to afford a hard drive. Well, uh, now I'm kind of covered on that. So very helpful. I, I certainly do appreciate it. So let's talk a little bit about the footage that we're looking at here. We're getting here toward the end um, of this particular dungeon and this was really difficult i mean this dungeon is filled filled uh with death lords overlords and then this freaking you know hulking draugr as well uh, they can all shout uh just nasty stuff so i was really concerned about how i was going to stay alive here and this actually worked out in a really uh kind of a cool way. I wasn't really sure how I was going to approach this. At first I thought maybe I could hang back in the corridor here, but then I realized that if I was able to one-shot these Draugr, if I had a bow that was powerful enough to one-shot them, I could do that. I could get away with that. But knowing full well that my bow does not have that capacity, it forced me to sort of think outside the box. And what I decided to do was rely on my stealth to get in there and then find a place to dig in inside where I could do little raids, if you will. So this is all about, you know, hiding and fast movement and good use of the spells that I have. So what I did here is at this point, they're all busting out of their crypts and I'm looking for a spot to hide. So I squeezed up in behind this big pillar and just sat tight. Now here, what I'm doing is, is just making liberal use of Ghost Walk to, to whittle away at them. And then when I feel like I've got, I've evened the odds a little bit, then I change my tactics slightly. Started out with, now the Ghost Walk is going to give me about 10 seconds or so of invisibility. I can get more invisibility out of it by dual casting it. Ooh, I almost got spotted there. But I elect to just be kind of a one-hand caster with this thing. It just simplifies things. It means that I'm not doing a lot of weapon switching when I'm invisible and can't actually see what's happening. So what I do is kind of wait, go invisible, ambush somebody, which teleports me back to the original location, and then I go invisible again and I will sit tight. Now here I'm just using invisibility um, just to keep from being spotted. And then I'll cast it again to re-engage it, get 10 seconds back, and then I'll do another ambush, right? So here I'm just kind of doing a little bit of a guerrilla warfare kind of thing, pecking away at them. My goal really was to try and deal with the Dragon Priest first. Because I was worried about his, you know, fireballs and lightning bolts and all that nasty stuff. So I just kept ambushing him until I had him on the ropes. Now, ideally, attacking him from behind is the best the best thing. I get better bonuses, better damage bonuses when I'm doing sneak attacks on him, but he, he wasn't always oriented in, in a way that made it easy for me to get to him. So then I started spreading my attacks out a little bit. I went and attacked another Draugr and then came back to my original location, hoping that I could get the enemies to mix it up a little bit, and then I was able to get a nice kind of a backstab shot finally on the dragon priest it was just about timing I was really worried at this point that I was going to get flanked so I kept kind of popping around here and looking on the one side and then popping back and see they're kind of hanging out there okay that's the first one I eliminated. Now the Dragon Priest is here. I got a bad shot in on him there. 
But this this was really interesting to me, and I, I felt like this was really kind of fun gameplay. It it felt like it felt like what Fleet would do. Uh, I think Fleet is he's he's powerful when he's in his element, but I think part of what makes Fleet who he is is his scrappiness. And uh, to me, this is all about scrappiness. He digs himself in in a place where they seem reluctant to chase him and then uses everything he's got at his advantage, right? So here, by coming out a little bit, I can attack that guy. And now they kind of don't know where the attacks are coming from, so they're constantly, you know, going all over the place as I'm just messing with them here. But it was a lot of fun. So this is Ghost Walk. And then, again, the perk that I'm using on the bow is called Lion's Arrow. And I have tied to my bow using the Lion's Arrow perk, the Shadow Bond spell. Okay. Now, the sword that I'm using, I have smithed it up as far as I'm capable of smithing it up. And then I have put a spell on it that uh, drains some health for additional damage. Here, my short blade. On the short blade, I've got an enchantment on that that damages armor rating. So the Dragon Priest is out. We've got one Draugr out, two Draugr out. Now I've got two left. And at this point, there's no Draugr in the room that hasn't been hit by me at least once. So I'm kind of slowly whittling away at them. But now I decided that it was time to really sort of change position. So I'm using instincts to try and figure out where the two remaining enemies are. And the radius on my instinct ability isn't good enough to tell me where they are. So I know they're here, but I'm not exactly sure where. So I started kind of coming out of hiding, trying to use myself as bait to get them to stick their noses out where I could see them. And I spotted this guy. So I just kind of went full tilt run, got a shot in on him to get his attention and do a little damage, and then went back into my hidey hole. And then I'm gonna use Whirlwind Sprint to change position. Uh, and do it rapidly enough that they can't kind of mess with me along the way. Here's a charging power attack, which I don't think connected very well. It's it's difficult to do uh, when you're invisible sometimes. It's, it's hard to pull off combat maneuvers when you can't see yourself. Um, and I always do combat maneuvers in third person. I prefer to do it in third person. So we got two left. This one, he let me get behind him. Now he's kind of got me penned in here. And I really want out of this situation, so I went to Whirlwind Sprint and then shot past him and jumped over the boulder. And here we're doing the same technique, different corner here. But now this, this was really fun. This is when I really started messing with him because I'm using... Uh, the environment around me so that their shouts and they throw a lot of shouts at me but their shouts break break over the pillars and the rocks like like waves you know and uh, you can see when they're getting ready to swing at me I'm just you know popping in and out of visibility ghost walk is pulling me in and out it makes me extremely difficult for them to hit and then I'm using the environment to mess with them so they think I'm going one way and I actually go the other I double back you know, stuff like that. So the, these guys are really having a difficult time. So here, coming out, doing a little bit of damage each time. Got them on the ropes, shout them down. And then this was a charging power attack when I can actually see what I'm doing. And that connected big time. That was super satisfying. <laughs> so it was just, it's a ton of fun. And I highly encourage you to do this. Um, play test a character, you know, come up with a concept but then take some time to just pick some locations and screw around. If you happen to be on the PC and can use console commands, you know, use a console command like uh, TMM space one to reveal everything on your map. Pick a location that you think is going to have some enemies you want to test against and go and play test your theories. You know, figure out what your combat style is before you commit to your story, bef before you commit to your role play. Um, because quite often, the style of your character's combat can also be built into your whole concept, into your character's background and stuff. Why is Fleet like this? Why does he fight like this? 
How did he learn to fight like this? Suddenly you've got all these cool questions you can answer about role play that have to do with the research that you've done um, prior to starting out. So create a character, uh, advance, advance your levels artificially using console commands if you can, and get in there and just try some of these perks and stuff, especially if you're playing with Ordinator. Um, you really don't have a good idea of what the possibilities are until you've done some experimentation and you're, you've combined the Ordinator perk, uh, perk trees with the Apocalypse spells. Uh, Anai Sion is, is a pretty brilliant modder and he has very specifically created spells in Apocalypse spell package that are designed to work well with his perk overhaul. So... If you're interested in that checking in checking that out, I highly encourage you to do that. If you go to um, the Couch Warrior TV YouTube channel, you will find a playlist there called Tutorials, and you will find a tutorial in there that kind of goes over uh, a safe way to use console commands to advance your character up however many levels you need to to do playtesting. If you happen to be on PC and can use console commands, that's a great way to do it. Um, if you're not on PC, you you might have to, uh, you know, on a console, just kind of play it through. But, you know, create a character that you can use as, as a brief test and invest at least a little bit of time in exploring as much as you can with the perk tree. So that is it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm leaving you here with a little bit of footage of a, a dragon battle. This was kind of interesting. And you can see I have taken some perks that make the bow quite powerful at long range. But they're perks that are designed to give me bonuses on damage depending on how far away from the target I am. So I hit the dragon. Now if, if, this, if this were a bow that I had created, if I had crafted it myself... It's possible I could have taken him down half hit points or more with a single shot. But that just isn't how it works in this situation. Now, the cool thing about this is prior to going into this battle, uh, I used my Lion's Arrow power and I assigned a new spell to my bow. So at this point, I'm using a Restoration spell that does kind of the equivalent of Curse or Disease-type damage. It, it adds some additional some additional damage to my shots provided it hits. So you see me release that arrow and then there's a ball, a green ball that follows it and it travels quite a bit slower uh, than the arrow itself. But when I get into those close range fights with a dragon, uh, it, it hits pretty regularly. And in this case, in the end, I think it was, it was the poison from that spell that uh, finally did this dragon in. So here I'm just using the environment to try and not take the brunt of his damage. There I missed my first shot, but as he was flying away, I hit him in the tail and that was enough to bring him down. So at this point, I'm just making sure that I'm changing position a lot. I don't wanna make it easy for him. And I want to make sure that I'm in, in a situation where it's just really difficult for him to get at me. Because you see this dragon, he's aggressive. He gets down on the ground and he charges. And so my objective is to make him regret that. So staying in amongst the trees really helps. But at this range, boy, watch the, the flames just wash over everything. He hits me directly there, but I broke up his breath weapon by using an unrelenting force shout, which caused him to, it interrupted his, his attack. And at this point, I just kind of settle back and the poison is what eventually kills him. You see he drops dead right in the middle of breathing fire on me. So that was kind of the residual effect of that poison damage that I had been doing with to him with those disease spells or whatever. But this is the kind of stuff that we'll cover in a lot more detail once we get the series started. But I wanted to give you a little taste of what was going on, let you know uh, what it is that I'm working on. I really appreciate everybody, uh, all the support. Again, thank you to everyone who has been so supportive of this effort. And I look forward to sharing this story with you. 
Uh, that, of course, brings us to the end of this update. Thank you for taking the journey with me. Uh, you know, and to all Skyrim assassins, I salute you. Silence is our battle cry.